Uh, real quick, uh, we started a new thing for, for paid subscribers because we get flooded on a daily basis. And I'm not kidding when I say daily basis. Even on the weekends, we will get emails uh, or vo- voicemails left at the office asking, Eric mentioned such and such. Can you get me a link? Well, we've started putting it together every day. All the links to all the stuff I talk about so you can read it for yourself without my narration. Uh, you can see it. You can get it. All you got to do is text the word show to 33777. The bottom link will say get my daily email and you click that link and there you have it. You follow that through, subscribe and you'll get it. Um, you can also with that link, uh, if you text show to 33777, you'll get all of the, uh, you'll get the 24-7 live stream link. And you'll get the podcast links available at iTunes, Spotify, Google, and Stitcher. But that last one's the one you want. If you want the daily stack of stuff, uh, you want to click that link, and you'll get all of the stuff I'm using for show prep for the show. So you can see the links for yourself. You can go back to it later. If you forget something I've said, you want to see it, it's all there. Now, uh, I want to spend a few moments uh, talking about off-roads in Ukraine. If there are any, can we have any? I was reading last night about uh, the Napoleonic War and Napoleon's invasion of Russia. It went very badly for them, disease and famine, not just cold weather. And the Russians essentially decided they needed to get Napoleon out of Russia. And essentially what they did is they provided what they called their golden path. They blocked every route made it difficult for Napoleon to to pass except for one route out of the country, and they made it plain as day, this is your way out. Go here, get out. They did. And then after Napoleon's forces headed out, uh, the Russians gathered behind them and killed as many more as they could. Hundreds of thousands went in, less than 100,000 came out of Napoleon's troops. It was a massive defeat, uh, sent him into exile, but they provided him an exit solution. We need to be starting to think about off-ramps for Putin. And that's the conversation going around in the corridors of leadership right now that you and I are not privy to. They're trying to figure out what can they offer Vladimir Putin to get out. The problem, if sources are to be believed, is that right now what they're coming up with is nothing. There is nothing at this moment that anyone thinks they can offer Vladimir Putin to get out of Ukraine. And they got to come up with something. Uh, A friend of mine at the office uh, sent me this link. Uh, Fiona Hill is one of the most clear-eyed Russia experts out there. She studied Putin for decades. She worked in Republican and Democratic administrations. Uh, She met her demise from the uh, Trump administration during the impeachment hearings. Uh, But this... Reporter for Yahoo News, Maura Reynolds, reached out to her to see what on earth do you think could he really use nukes? Sadly, we're treading back through old historic patterns that we said we would never permit to happen again, Fiona Hill said. The old historic patterns include Western businesses who failed to see how they help a tyrant build his war chest, admirers enamored with an autocrat's strength and politicians' tendency to point fingers inward for political gain. But at the same time, Fiona Hill says it's not too late to turn Putin back. And it's a job not just for Ukraine or for NATO. It's a job that ordinary Westerners and companies can assist in important ways. Ukraine has become the front line in a struggle, not just because democracies and autocracies, but in a struggle for maintaining a rules-based system in which the things that countries want are not taken by force. Every country in the world should be paying attention to this. There's lots of dangers ahead, Fiona Hill warned. Putin is increasingly operating emotionally and likely to use all weapons at his disposal, including nuclear ones. Every time you think, no, he wouldn't, would he? Well, yes, he would, Hill said, and he wants us to know that, of course. It's not that we should be intimidated and scared. We have to prepare for those contingencies and figure out what it is we're going to do to head them off. I wonder if Putin's days are numbered 
in Russia. Uh, a bit of interesting insight, I, I think, from Tom Nichols, who, regardless of whether you agree with him on, on other issues, is an expert on Russia. He points out that uh, the Russians view Ukrainians as their kinsmen, as their kindred spirits, as their countrymen, as their brothers. The Russians hate NATO, though. If Russia suddenly pivots and claims it's fighting NATO, you may have people willing to go to bat in Russia for Putin who aren't willing to go to bat for him with Ukraine. So you have to be very diplomatic there. You have to be careful there. But I wonder what the the path out of Ukraine is. We have remarkable intelligence in Ukraine and Russia. I actually wonder, do we have the same level of intelligence uh, in China that we do in Russia? Because it's very interesting. One of the things that I do think Joe Biden got right was releasing publicly a lot of our intelligence. Now, I know some disagree on that. Some disagree on that strategy of making it public. But I think the Biden administration did want to make very clear to Russia, we know exactly what you're doing, and we're going to prove to you by making public and broadcasting what you're doing before you do it as a way to signal we've got deep, deep, deep intelligence inside Russia. And I do think perhaps it it stalled what Putin was doing. But I also find it remarkable that despite all of that information and knowing what he was going to do, the White House still twiddled its thumbs on how to help Ukraine. It's remarkable that we had all that intelligence and we twiddled our thumbs on whether or not we would be co-belligerents if we helped Ukraine. But this, I find, this is from NBC News. U.S. intelligence agencies have determined that Russian President Vladimir Putin is growing increasingly frustrated by his military struggles in Ukraine, and many see his only option as doubling down on violence. Current and former U.S. officials briefed on the matter told NBC News. As the Russian economy teeters under unprecedented global sanctions and his purportedly superior military force appears bogged down, Putin has lashed out in anger at underlings, even as he remains largely isolated from the Kremlin in part because of concerns about COVID. This is somebody that's clearly been caught off guard by the size of the Ukrainian resistance, Senator Mark Warner, Democrat of Virginia, chairman of the Intelligence Committee, told MSNBC. He has isolated himself. He's not been in the Kremlin very much. You've got less and less input, and those inputs are from sycophants. He added, I do worry that he's been backed into a corner. I do worry that there's no obvious on-ramp. Western intelligence agencies have good visibility into Putin right now and are closely watching his moves for any significant behavioral changes, several current and former officials said. Four U.S. officials said there's no intelligence saying he's mentally unstable, but they said he has displayed a different pattern of behavior from the past. The U.S. has solid intelligence that Putin is frustrated and directing unusual bursts of anger at people in his inner circle over the state of the military campaign and the worldwide condemnation of his actions. One former and two current U.S. officials briefed on the intelligence said, this is unusual, they say, because Putin, a former intelligence officer, usually keeps his emotions in check. Y'all, that's remarkable depth of intelligence. And by the way, I do actually believe this is true. Republicans and Democrats alike both tell me we have amazing sources inside the Kremlin, that we have amazing uh, human being intelligence from inside the Kremlin. Makes me wonder who that spy is. And it's more than one. But here's what we know as well from that intelligence. The worst is yet to come. And there's an important point here. One of the reasons, and again, we, we've got highly accurate intelligence. And so it appears safe to say one of the reasons they're doing what they're doing, one of the reasons Putin is doing what he's doing, one of the reasons the Russians are going all out like they are is because they got away with it in Georgia in Crimea, and in Syria. Western powers 
continued to embolden Vladimir Putin because Vladimir Putin told him what he was going to do. He said he was going after Crimea, and he did. He said he was going to go flip the government in Georgia, and he did. And he said he was going to back the Syrian government, and he did. Brutally, bloody, awful thermobaric bombs that sucked the oxygen out of people's lungs, killing them. He did. He did all these awful, awful, awful things. War crimes. And he got away with it. Brutal suppressions, brutal crackdowns, brutal invasions with brutal weapons used against civilians. He got away with it all. So it's natural that the bully, who's never been stood up to by Western powers, particularly when he invaded Ukraine in 2008 and then in 2014 seizing Crimea, Western leaders never did jack to him. He never expected to see what's happening. He never expected it. He completely underestimated what would happen if he tried to take over the whole country. He blew it. But his expectations were built by his prior experience. If you don't stand up to the bully the first time, it only gets worse. And Europe finally had to stand up to him. And he thought he could get away with it because no one had stood up to him before. And now he doesn't know what to do. The bully, when people stand up to him, usually his first response is to throw harder punches. And finally back down when that doesn't work. So I would suggest and say to you to expect in the next 48 hours, we're going to see some awful stuff come out of Ukraine. We're probably going to see some terrible, terrible stuff come out of Ukraine. Because the bully's going to throw some harder punches first. And when it doesn't land the blows, when it doesn't have the impact, when they keep standing up to him, maybe then he'll back down. But it's going to be very important for us to figure out what are the off-ramps. How can we get him to leave Ukraine without forcing us into the breach to take action that we probably should not be taking? This is above my pay grade and yours, but these are the things you and I have to consider. I will tell you this. Every night, I have stayed up until midnight. Every night, I've stayed up until midnight because I've wanted every day, every night, to make sure the sun was rising in Kiev with the Ukrainians still in charge of their city. Every night, I want to go to bed knowing that city has not fallen. And thus far, it hasn't. And I'm afraid it's going to get worse for him before it gets better because Putin doesn't know what else to do. He's always been given a pass by Western powers, and he's just stunned, apparently, from our intelligence that they're not giving him a pass now, which means he's going to have to resort to more violence. This is uh, the latest from CBS News out of Ukraine. Transgender acceptance in Ukraine is not widespread, and changing legal documents to match gender requires a long process with psychiatric examinations. CBS News spoke to one woman in Kyiv who is now battling a war within a war and Russia's invasion. <sighs> wow. Um, okay. Okay, someone out there said, hey, go get a different angle on the war. I know, let's go do the transgender angle. It'll make the wokes feel like they've got some emotional investment in the war. Good grief, my goodness. Um, the guest list for the First Lady State of the Union box at, at, at uh, the Capitol uh, has been um, listed, and uh, Doug Emdorf will be there. That is the second gentleman, Kamala Harris's husband. Uh, Valerie Biden Owens is going to be there, the president's sister. And this is good. The ambassador of Ukraine, uh, Oksana Mar Markarova, is going to join the first lady. That's really good. And then there will also be these people. Um, 
Joseph Jojo Burgess, a new employee organizer trainer for the Steelworkers. Joseph Davis, a seventh grader at Swift Creek Middle School in uh, Virginia. He's a diabetes advocate. Uh, Riff Noduro, who is a progressive care unit nurse at the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center. Uh, Pat Gelsinger, chief executive officer of Intel, will be there. Francis Hogan, the, the Facebook whistleblower, will be there. Melissa Isaac, uh, the protector of the young at the Michigan Department of Education's Indigenous Education Initiative and founder of the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribes Project Aware Program will be there. Danielle Robinson, the surviving spouse of Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson will be there. Uh, he was uh, died of lung cancer. And then uh, Kezia Rodriguez, from North Bergen, New Jersey, will be their student parent at Bergen Community College. Those are the people who will be with the president. So you're going to have the Intel CEO there and the ambassador uh, from Ukraine there, which is good, which is good. Um, I, I think I was going to actually say that if the ambassador from Ukraine were not there, the ambassador needed to be there. Now, also happening, I mentioned this earlier, uh, Senate Georgia Senate candidate Herschel Walker is pulling out of a weekend event organized by U.S. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene after she attended a white nationalist rally where attendees cheered Russia's invasion of Ukraine and chanted Vladimir Putin's name. Walker had planned to speak at Greene's Second Amendment and Freedom Rally in Rome, Georgia on Saturday alongside U.S. Representative Matt Gates, strategist Steve Bannon, and other right-wing figures. U.S. Senator David Perdue, now running for Georgia's governor, intends to attend the event. So Herschel Walker distanced himself from a woman who showed up knowingly at a white nationalist event. And David Perdue is going to go because he needs every vote he can possibly get, including the people who are totally fine with candidates showing up knowingly at white nationalist events. Now, you know, on, on this Wintez guy, let me give you his actual quote so that y'all don't think I'm making it up. Uh, Fuentes, this is his quote. First of all, you should know he called uh, Matt Walsh from the Daily Wire a Shabo Goy race trader because he works for Ben Shapiro. And then he said this, enough with the Jim Crow stuff, who cares? Oh, I had to drink out of a different water fountain. Big effing deal. Oh, no. They had to go to a different school. And even if it was bad, who cares? It was better for them. It was better for us. Meaning white people. It's better for black people. Better for black people. Big effing deal. Segregation, he said. That's the guy who introduced Marjorie Taylor Greene on stage. That's the guy who said throwing Jews into the ovens in the Holocaust was just like baking cookies. She went to that event, and now David Perdue is going to go stand on stage with her. Herschel Walker had the good sense to avoid her. Hi there. It's Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. If you would like to be a part of the program, I would be glad for you to be a part of the program. Reminder, if you're on a Cox Media Group station, Tulsa, Dayton, Athens, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Orlando, I will be with you after the State of the Union address tonight. Uh, to be with you and do some uh, post-State of the Union coverage. The State of the Union is tonight. It's going to be interesting to see a uh, reset. And, of course, Joe Biden out there trying to unite the country with this rhetoric today. your help, we're going to keep pushing on this. And we're, we're protecting our country's threshold liberty, the sacred right to vote, which I've never seen is under such attack. You know, it's always made it harder for blacks to vote, but this is trying to be able to figure out how to keep the black vote when it occurs from even counting. Over the past year. Yeah. Um, yeah, real real unity there. Real unity there, Joe. Really, really appreciate the unity on this. And um, also, you got Jen Psaki out there saying we're not going to get rid of Russian gas. In fact, we're going to have more windmills. But what's most interesting is late yesterday, Kamala Harris decided to go off script. It's the gift that keeps on giving to Republicans today. Because as we all know, elections matter. 
And when folks vote, they order what they want, and in this case, they got what they asked for. <laughs> I went off script a little bit. <laughs> so folks got what they asked for. That is going to be a remarkable Republican commercial, is it not? Remarkable. What did they get? Empty store shelves. They got what they wanted. Got what they voted for. They got inflation. They got high gas prices. Got war in Ukraine. They got uh, schools falling behind and kids falling behind. They got all these these wonderful things. Um, Yeah, that's going to be a great Republican attack. I'll tell you another Republican attack that should work but is not. In Washington, you know, Everett Dirksen used to be the Republican leader in Washington. He had a saying. It's been embraced by some people for a while. It has been some because the implications that Democrats are, are the evil party. But the great Everett Dirksen once said that in Washington, D.C., there are two parties. There's the stupid party and the evil party. Every once in a while, the stupid party and the evil party get together and they do something that is both stupid and evil. And the press call that bipartisanship. There is a bipartisan effort led by Republicans in Georgia and Utah and Oklahoma to kill school choice. In Utah, it is dead. The Utah House of Representatives, led by Republicans there, they have killed school choice. They have killed the ability of parents to rescue their children from failing public schools. It is overwhelmingly supported by parents. In Oklahoma, the governor of Oklahoma has stepped in. The Speaker of the House in Oklahoma has attempted to kill the measure. The governor of Oklahoma is rallying to support the measure. And now in Georgia, Republicans in the Georgia legislature are killing school choice. But not really all the Republicans. A handful of Republicans in the Georgia House of Representatives are using the Speaker of the House to block a vote on school choice so that they don't have to go on record opposing it. You you need to understand this. There are Democrats, black Democrats, in the Georgia House of Representatives that support school choice. Finally, they've always opposed it, but after COVID and lockdowns, you now have bipartisan, multiracial support. But the Speaker of the House of Representatives in Georgia is killing it. He claims it's because a pro-school choice group made him mad by attacking Republicans. Not really. What they accurately pointed out is if you're a Republican and you pose it, you're on Stacey Abrams' side. It's true. Stacey Abrams opposes it. The Speaker didn't want some of his Republican colleagues to have to vote on it because it more than likely will pass with bipartisan support. And he doesn't want them to have to go on the record voting against it in large part because they're all in new districts now and someone could primary them. And he doesn't want his team primaried. So he's put a hold on the school choice bill. Uh, A friend of mine who's a world-renowned pollster said he conducted a poll in David Ralston's district in Blue Ridge, Georgia, and 80% of voters support it. 80% of, of voters support it in his district, Democrat and Republican. And he's going to kill it to protect some Republicans, some of whom are married to public school teachers, and so they're opposed to it. He didn't want the vote. Now, if you text the word ACTION to the phone number 55444 and you are in Georgia, you'll go to my Action Center and you'll be able to generate phone calls and tweets to your state representative telling them to vote. What I highly recommend is you just skip the tweet and click on the phone button. If you text ACTION to 55444, you'll get a link. Click the link, open it on your phone, you put in your address and phone number, and you see, you'll see a picture of a telephone. You push that picture of the telephone, 
and you will get a call from me on your phone, and I will direct you how to talk to your representative, and I'll give you some basic talking points. Change them up if you want. But you should be telling your state representative to support school choice. If you see your state representative, tell your state representative to support school choice in Georgia. Tell them to put the measure there, two of them. The big one is House Bill 999, and tell them to do it. Don't let the Democrats and the Speaker of the House in Georgia kill school choice. The votes are there. The governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, has come out in support of the measure, said he would sign it into law. The votes are there in the Senate. And by the way, those of you in the Georgia Senate, you should be advancing these bills separately. Why is there no good leadership in the Senate? Advance the bill and send it to the House. You advance the same bill and send it to the House. Buy time for the legislation. But those of you in Utah listening to me right now, you need to understand the Republicans in your House of Representatives have already killed it. And those of you in Ohio and Oklahoma, rather, who are listening to me, you need to understand your Speaker of the House is attempting to kill school choice. Your Speaker of the House is attempting to kill parents' rights to send their children to the school of their choice. And then I find these stories, and these are infuriating stories. And you should be mad about these stories as well. A Michigan school board has been doing oppo on parents. In Rochester, Michigan, a community school board has been outing parents. The district superintendent, Robert Shaner, contacted the employers of parents whose social media posts they deem concerning or aggressive, according to a lawsuit filed in May of last year, now revealed. Only the posts weren't actually concerning or aggressive. They were expressing the belief that schools should be open amid COVID concerns. The parents did not agree with the district's decision to teach students remotely. If and when they voiced their displeasure on social media, Shaner and the school board contacted their employers and hinted that they had made threats against the school board. In one incident, they called local police. During a deposition earlier this month, Shaner admitted, or I guess now last month, Shaner admitted to calling the employers of some parents. In at least one case, a parent lost his job as a result. Rather than fess up, Shaner used his deposition to congratulate himself and the school board members for monitoring parents' social media actively and carefully. Yeah, so again, I just want to make it clear about social media. We do watch it and try to make sure we know what's going on in our community, but that's not the only place that we get information on social media. Believe it or not, there are parents that support what we're doing, and they often share what's going on in social media with us as well. Yeah, we value the input of all parents, and we certainly want to keep our thumb on the pulse of community, so we monitor social media very closely on all fronts and make sure we're responsive to the community. The school board wound up settling the lawsuit. The school board targeted parents to cost them their jobs. Every single, every single Republican across the country should be supporting school choice. Every single Republican across the country should be allowing parents to direct their children's education. And every single Republican across the nation in elected office should be protecting the parents from school boards like this one in Michigan. But here in Georgia... Here in Georgia, and those of you listening on our affiliates in Oklahoma, those of you listening in Utah, those of you listening in Texas, your Republicans are against your right to choose where to send your school unless you got money. 
And that's the real divide here. If you have money, they are perfectly willing to let you go wherever you want to go. If you got money, you can afford to get your kid into a private school. We send our kids to private school. We do. Make no bones about it. It's a small Christian school. And our kids get fantastic lessons in Bible. I mean, my oldest is diving deep in Romans right now with, with her teachers. My youngest is, is they've gone through Genesis last semester. This semester, they're working on Exodus, asking deep questions about salvation. It's our choice. We have the money to be able to send our kids there. A lot of parents don't. A lot of parents are stuck sending their kids to a failing public school. And they would love the opportunity to get out. And in every state that has embraced school choice, the state has become more Republican. I mean, y'all, the data is there. The data is there. You want to turn your state more to the GOP. You want parents to become more supportive of Republicans. You want black and Hispanic parents to vote Republican. You give them school choice. Because the Democrats are so wedded to teachers' groups, they can't afford for you to give your kids that choice. You support school choice, you make your state more Republican. Georgia is now a swingier state than Florida. Georgia is a state where it's a very real possibility Stacey Abrams could get elected in large part because David Perdue is using his ridiculous challenge to potentially cost Brian Kemp an election. Georgia is a state because it's had such an influx of blue state voters moving into the state that it's going wobbly. You want to lock in Republican dominance in Georgia, you give parents the choice on where to send their kid to school and dare the Democrats to kill the program. You do. It's what you do. And the Republicans in the state of Georgia refuse to do it. The Speaker of the House in Georgia has been given thousands of dollars from public school teachers groups. And now he just coincidentally kills this piece of legislation that would allow parents to govern where their kids go. You should wage holy hell on your elected officials in Georgia for refusing to allow you the ability to get your kid out of a failing public school. Text the word ACTION to 55444. I will connect you to your state representative. Be very polite. Make sure your representative knows you are a constituent, you are a voter, and you're not afraid to vote against them in a primary. They think you won't do it. They think they can get away with it. We are seeing more and more abuse in the public school system of wokes, of social justice warriors, of critical race theory, indoctrination, all of this stuff, we're seeing it. Parents want their kids to escape it, and it's the Republicans, not the Democrats, in states like Georgia and Utah that are forcing parents to keep their kids in failing schools unless they're rich. Private school and alternative school systems should not just be the privilege of the rich. They should be a parent's right by using their tax dollars to direct their child's education. And you should make the Republicans understand that. Text ACTION to 55444. Phone number is, well, who cares? The show's almost out of time. (laughs) I don't want to talk to you anyway. (laughs) I kid, I kid, I kid. Jared Allen. He has learned not to be an Android user. (laughs) Jared Allen. Uh, is a Cleveland Cavaliers basketball player. Uh, He used to be at the the Nets. And, well, he was bullied into getting an iPhone because his teammates wouldn't let him be part of a group text because they didn't want the green chat bubbles. Nobody wants the green chat bubbles. It's like you're you're texting with the pores. (laughs) You know, this really is a thing, and it shouldn't be a thing, but it is. Uh, so if you are, if, if, for those of you who have Android devices and you've never experienced this, when you're texting Apple device to Apple device, it generates a blue chat bubble, which means you're going through Apple's iMessage service, which means you have a very secure end-to-end chat. 
I can, for example, and have done so, uh, texted credit card numbers through Apple iMessage because it's very secure. But if it's a green chat bubble, it's a standard SMS um, it, chat, and it's very insecure. It is very easily hackable. And um, so a lot of kids realize security is an issue with their parents, and some of them, just because they think they're cool with an iPhone, they don't want kids in their chat groups with, with uh, green chat bubbles. It turns out uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers players would not let Jared Allen be in their chats because of it as well. Now, you should know I have a pig-headed producer who refuses to get an iPhone to spite me. He's got an Apple laptop, and we send him all of his text messages on that because we don't want green chat bubbles around here uh, with, with our text messages either. And so he just gets flooded with text messages when he turns on his computer because we're just not sending them to his phone. It is a thing. But, you know, the larger issue here is is people getting phones. We have our – we gave our daughter a phone way sooner than we wanted. You know, we were like, we're not giving her a phone until she starts driving. Two years ago. Before she started driving, when she was 14, uh, we gave her her first phone. She might have been 13, actually. The reason was because I took her on a class field trip, and there was silence in the car. I, it was me and four girls in my car, four girls in the car. They were silent because the girls were chatting with each other on iMessage, and my daughter could not participate in the conversations because she didn't have a phone. They're so uh, chat message, uh, text message oriented. It was the craziest thing. These girls were having a full conversation in the backseat of my car without saying a word. They were just chatting back and forth. And I asked my kid afterwards if it was normal or they just didn't want me to hear. She said, totally normal, totally normal. Uh, But she couldn't participate because she didn't have a phone. And it was that moment. It was like, yeah, yeah, to for you to be able to, to have friends in your school, you're going to have to have a phone. We limited her time and stuff, but had to. But even her friends, they don't want green chat bubbles in the text messages. you got to have an iPhone. It really is a thing. It's 2022. Things are still crazy. Things haven't settled down. And now you got the Federal Reserve and interest rates. you got the economy. you got inflation. A lot of banks won't even return your phone call. Let's say you're a small business and you need a loan for $750,000 or higher. You see an opportunity where banks, they don't even want to see you. You want to buy a building? You want to build a building? Reach out to the Frost family at First Liberty Building and Loan. They've been helping small businesses become big businesses since the 1990s. They want to help you if they can. So spend 10 minutes with them. See if you're a good fit for them and they're a good fit for you. Their website is firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. Again, you need a loan, $750,000 or higher. You're a small business and you see an opportunity to grow. Share it with the Frost family and see if they can help you. Firstlibertyga.com. That's firstlibertyga.com. First Liberty Building and Loan can help businesses nationwide become bigger businesses. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.